13. So that's where we're going to start. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 13. We read these words. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it, make, how can it be made salty again? <clears throat> it's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. <clears throat> Now, whenever I read a text like this, I can just see it on your faces. Oh, great. This is going to be a great one. Evangelism, witness, you know. I feel the, the guilt is just beginning to heap up on everyone here. Everyone's thinking, oh, my goodness, I hate when he has to deal with these kind of texts. But I hope that that isn't your, your attitude this morning. And I hope that by the time we're all done with this thing today, you will be encouraged by the fact that you are salt and light to this world in which we live. That's my objective, anyway. But there's something about evangelism that brings together all kinds of strange notions in us. And I don't know, when we set out to do it, sometimes it brings up the strangeness in us, too. And I'm not sure why that is. But when I think about evangelism, there's certain images that come to mind. So let me just share with you a few of them. I always like this, uh, this cover for this book. The Mind Changers. And if you see the little cartoon here, it's like the Crusader who's got the Muslim down on the ground there with his spear and he's got his knife up in the other hand. And the, the Muslim guy said, tell me more about this Christianity. <laughs> I'm terribly interested. <laughs> and sometimes evangelism seems a bit like that. Or maybe it's like those Mormon missionaries that come door to door and knock on your door. Or maybe like those Jesus saves guys in the middle of the stands, or even putting John 3.16, you know. Or the guy that holds up the John 3.16 in the, in the goal posts at the end of the football. Or, or those guys that put up those crazy signs, those kind of hateful signs uh, at funerals and other places from Westboro Baptist Church. Um, but sometimes it's also... Just the average ordinary person, a friend, sharing naturally with another person. And sometimes it's the guy with the prepare to meet thy God sign plastered on front of him. Or the crazy sign like God is angry with the wicked every day. It makes you wonder, what is, is that good news? I'm not so sure. Um, street preachers. One of my favorites is this guy. Brother Mays, if you ever go to the Appalachian Museum, I think it's in Tennessee, it's right off of 75. We used to, there's a fascinating little museum, the Appalachian Museum. In it, you've got this, uh, this display of Brother Mays, is the name of this guy right here, this happy man on the side here. And uh, Brother Mays was a West Virginia coal miner, and he was in uh, a, one of the, a mine disaster, and he almost lost his life. And after that, he left the mining business, and he felt that God had called him to place religious signs all over the universe, literally. <laughs> um, and so he began to make up these signs, and he planted them all over. In every state in the Union, he managed eventually to plant a sign, at least one, in several countries overseas, and he had plans even to take them to places like Jupiter. You see this? Direct on the planet Jupiter in 1990. He had all kinds of things planned ahead. He even had a bicycle that he would roll around on and just said, get right with God. This, this uh, is dedicated to outer space. And he says, I hope to ride it on the moon and many of the planets erecting sacred signs. Love that. I mean, but it makes me wonder, why does evangelism always bring out the strangeness in us? The weirdness in it? Because it does. It's like, it makes us want to do weird things. <laughs> or maybe we think we've got to be like Billy Sunday, you know, by a rimstone. Or, you know, a televangelist. Or 
Billy Graham. I wish I were Billy Graham, but that's not the gift that God gave me. Billy Graham has a unique gift that God has given. And not, you don't have to be Billy Graham to be a great evangelist. Praise God for Billy Graham and how many lives he's been able to touch down through the years. But you know, one of his secrets is something called Operation Andrew. Before they have the big crusades, how does he get the people there? A big part of it is he trains the people in the churches beforehand to invite their neighbors and friends and their co-workers and to bring them along with them to the event. He's been doing that for years and years and years and years. It's one of the secrets to getting so many people there. So when you start looking at all the strangeness that it brings out of us, you might feel a little bit like this cartoon. Oh no, not another sermon on evangelism. This is the last thing that I need to hear. But I hope you don't um, have that attitude toward sharing your faith. Another way I sometimes look at it is this. You, you know Norwegians have a strange holiday tra tradition called Ludifisk. And some of you might know about Ludifisk, but <clears throat> some of you may have even tasted Ludifisk once. <laughs> Um, maybe twice if you were really adventurous. Not too many times, probably, but there's this Norwegian tradition that at Christmas time, to prove that you're a good Norwegian, once a year, and you know what's coming, that once a year at Christmas time, somebody goes to the store and gets this dried white fish stuff, and it goes through a process of several weeks where you use lye and water. To, or to hydrate the fish once again. And then ultimately it comes up with this beautiful jello-like substance that has a horrible smell. And it's, you know, lye has been used in the process. I mean, this is not something you normally would be eating. Um, it, you soak it in all this, it, you rinse it with cold water to remove blood. Then you boil it or bake it, depending on your family recipe, and you put lots of butter on it. It's the only way you can eat it. You just put tons of melted <laughs> butter on the stuff. It's something that we do every Christmas time as good Norwegians because it proves that we're good Norwegians. It's not because it tastes good. Because it doesn't taste good. It tastes horrible. It smells bad. The texture's strange. There's nothing you like about it. But you're so happy when you get it over with. Oh, yeah, I'm a good Norwegian again. I've done my duty. I proved myself. I proved my courage. I proved my boldness. I was able to get it down one more year. And then you reminisce. Oh, well, you know, it wasn't that bad. It, 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 we could do it again next year. But, of course, <clears throat> you hope you don't. Evangelism is kind of like mood fisk. We think, you know, it's something I know that I should do. And if I'm going to be a good Christian, I'm going to prove myself by sharing my faith with somebody else. But I don't really want to do it. And I kind of dread having to do it because it brings out the strangeness in me and everybody else. And I'm afraid of what they might say. But occasionally, just to prove we're a good Christian, we're able to somehow share our faith occasionally with a few people. And we're so glad when it's over... So we can say, oh yeah, got it done for another year. Okay, now we're good. Now, that kind of attitude toward sharing our faith is the one I want to get us away from. I love uh, this little statement by St. Francis. It's, technically, we don't know whether he really said this. There's some debate about this. But I like the, the phrase anyway. Preach the gospel always. And when necessary, use words. <laughs> Now, whether he actually said this or didn't, I don't know. But what I think, I, I, I like what he's saying. And I think it's exactly what Jesus is saying. Who are you? You are, in your very nature and character, as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus, you are salt. And you are light. It's the nature of who you are. Live it out. Live it out every day. In everything you do, because that's the most important way that you're going to be salt and light. That's the way you're going to penetrate and make a difference in this world, is by being true to who you really are and allowing Jesus to live out his life through you. I don't think evangelism should make us strange or crazy or do weird things. In fact, we're best at it when we're just ourselves. 
Well, let's take a look at the text. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. This is who you are. It isn't saying, now go and try to be salty. It's not what it says. It says, you are. This is the very nature and character of who you are as a follower of Jesus. You are salt to the world around you. You're going to make a difference in the world around you, much like the salt, like the way we use salt in various ways. So what does it mean to be salt? And what is the what difference does it make when we're salt? Um, salt seasons, preserves, and purifies. Things. These are the three main ways it's used in the Bible. This it's especially a seasoning, of course. I mean, what do we use salt for more, most often? Seasons our food. It makes it taste good. The doctor gets mad at us. He said, we shouldn't use so much. But it makes it taste better, right? We know seasoning. Preserving. Sometimes it was used to preserve certain things. And sometimes it also was used in purification. Now, what is he talking about here? I like this, this old quote by Glenn Stoss, and He says... Jesus is talking about being different from the world, having a different taste. If we lose our distinction from the world's greed, uncaring, self-centeredness, exclusionism, unfaithfulness, and violence, then we have no purpose. We are tasteless and useless. When we start living by the values of the world, we lose our taste. We lose our seasoning. And he says, if Salt loses its seasoning, what good is it anyway? You just throw it out and trample all over it. And that's kind of, he says, we shouldn't do that. We should be living out and seasoning the world around us. Um, Job 6 uses salt this way. Can something tasteless be eaten without salt? And then in Colossians 4, 6, it tells us to let our speech always be with grace, seasoned, as it were, with salt. So when you're talking to people out in the world, season your message with grace, with salt. Make what you're saying attractive. Don't make it bad news. <laughs> Don't make it strange. Make it good news by the words that you choose to use. So again, we're seasoning first and foremost, but it also preserves um, the Dictionary of Biblical Imagery, there's a little quote. References to the covenant of salt capitalize on salt's preserving qualities as symbolic of a permanent, dissoluble relationship between God and his people. Likewise, salt is listed as a required addition to all burnt offerings because of its preserving qualities. There was this covenant that they had in the Old Testament like, called the covenant of salt which was used sometimes in marriage ceremonies and other indissolvable unions. It was supposed to be a permanent union. And they used salt as a representation of preservation, that it keeps things together. It makes that covenant solid. It's like saying, we're going to be faithful to each other, and it's not going to be dissolved, because it's going to be preserved technically by salt here. It's, it's using it as a symbol of preservation. And they did it in, even in the sacrifices, in the burnt offerings, they were supposed to use salt as a part of that, suggesting, again, purification as well as preservation. <laughs> so what does it really mean to be salty? What does it really mean to be salt to the earth? And what would it look like for you and for me? And again, it's not the strangeness. It means to be like Jesus, first and foremost. And what I mean by that is not that we go around doing miracles or walking on water or something like that. But what I mean is this, that the very character of Jesus is being seen in us. Have you ever noticed how everybody's attracted to Jesus? Little kids want to come and sit on Jesus' lap. Um, people, the crowds start coming whenever Jesus shows up on the scene. People like to be around Jesus. Jesus. And you think about it, what was he like? Loving. He was always
always love it on people. He was joyful. He was a man filled with peace, kindness, gentleness, meekness, patient. The fruit of the Spirit was displayed in Jesus to the utmost degree. And I don't know about you, but I like to be around those kind of people. Don't you? Don't you like to be around joyful, loving people? Kind, gentle people? People that are patient with me instead of always frustrated with me? And that's what Jesus was like. People throughout the Gospels are constantly attracted to be with him. He could have been condemning. He could have you know, tried to impress people, put on airs about how wonderful he was. And, or he could have been judgmental and condemning, but he wasn't. Instead, we see him eating with tax collectors and sinners, which really bugs the Pharisees because they think, you can't do that. Those are not people you associate with. And, and so Jesus kind of breaks some of the rules. But what is he doing? He's demonstrating love. He's demonstrating that he's a, the kind of person that you would want to be around. I went, uh, a number of years back, I ran into a chapter in Max Locato's book, When God Whispers Your Name. And I always kind of thought this was a fascinating little chapter. It's called, Why Jesus Went to Parties. It got, it got my attention when I first saw it. And uh, he's talking about John where Jesus gets invited to the wedding at Cana of Galilee. And he just asked a simple question. He was trying to find some deep meaning to it. He said, and I kind of got stuck on the first couple verses here. Why did Jesus go to this wedding anyway? Why? And um, so he asked the question, why would Jesus go to a wedding Good question. Why would Jesus on his first journey talk, take his followers to a party? Didn't they have work to do? Didn't he have principles to teach? Wasn't his time limited? How could a wedding fit with his purposes on earth? Why did Jesus go to the wedding? The answer, it's found in the second verse of John 2. Jesus and his followers were also invited to the wedding. When the bride and the groom were putting the guest list together, Jesus' name was included. And when Jesus showed up with a half a dozen friends, the invitation wasn't rescinded. Whoever was hosting the party was happy to have Jesus present. Be sure and put Jesus' name on the list, they must have said. Jesus wasn't invited because he was a celebrity. He wasn't one yet. This is the beginning of his ministry. The invitation wasn't motivated by his miracles because he hadn't done any yet. Then why did they invite him? He makes this profound statement. I suppose they liked him. <laughs> now, he goes on to develop that whole idea. But the simple truth that he's getting at here is something that we sometimes go over. We get caught up in the miracle and all the things that are going on. But there's something that says about who Jesus is. That he's the kind of guy that when you were planning a wedding party, you wanted to make sure you would invite. And I think we'd be the same way. If we really understood who Jesus really was, if we really got a grasp of his personality, if we really understood it, I think we'd want him to come too. So why did Jesus go to parties? I found this picture of, the, of Cana at Galilee, and I kind of liked it because every other picture I can find of this miracle, everybody has a somber face. And I'm thinking, what kind of a wedding party is that? I mean, you look at it. You, you do a Google search of the wedding at Cana, Jesus' first miracle at this wedding, and everybody's standing around with frowns on their faces. They look so serious. And I finally found one picture where it looks like they're kind of having fun. And, you know, I think that's the way it was. When you see Jesus, when he goes to Matthew's house with the tax collectors, or whether he's, you know, visiting Zacchaeus, and he goes to his house, and he has table fellowship with him. All through the Gospels, we see Jesus as somebody you'd want to come to your house, somebody you'd want to invite into your life. You see, I think sometimes we have this picture of Jesus that he's, serious and condemning and we're not so sure if we want to be around him. 
But in reality, when he walked on this earth, he was somebody you wanted to spend time with. He was somebody whose personality was inviting. What does it mean to be salty? It means to be somebody that other people would like to invite to their house when they had their next party. It would mean being somebody that's not condemning or proud or you know, looking down their nose at other people, always looking for them to make a fault or always ready to criticize or make some crazy remark. It means to be someone who loves deeply just like Jesus did. It means to be a joyful person. You think Jesus ever laughed? You know, I can't give you a chapter or verse, but I have to believe that he was a very joyful person, just based upon what we read all the way through the Bible. Children seem to love to come to him. He's always, there's this playful relationship that they seem to have. So, I guess the question is, what does it mean to be salty? It means to be a friendly, loving person that just reaches out in love to other people. And it also means being a merciful person, looking up to meet the needs of other people. If there's one thing we know about Jesus, when he saw people in need, what did he do? His heart was filled with compassion, and he did what needed to be done. This is the way he lived his life. So maybe another way I could say the same thing is this. Remember those qualities of the blessed in the kingdom? That they're the poor in spirit the mourning, the hungry and thirsty for righteousness, the meek. Let's go down the list. The peacemakers, um, the merciful. You see, the very qualities that invite us into the life in the kingdom are the same ones that Jesus is going to use in us to be salt and light to the world around us. It's those who are broken by life and have the humility that comes from that, that are going to reach out to other people who need Jesus. They're the most likely to be a witness and to reach out in a very real way. It's not those who are filled with pride and think, you know, I've come so far. I'm such a holy Christian. You know, I'm, I'm just so much holier than you. I'm so much better than you. I'm going to put up my sign now and tell you, prepare to meet thy God. Because that's a beautiful way to express my faith to you. No, it's going to be the person who loves. And, and people know that they are loved when they're around them. It's going to be those people who bring joy into the situation. And we can do it in the most natural ways. It's when you go to the grocery store. And, you know, the line gets a little long sometimes. Maybe on July 4th weekend or something. And you're standing there in line. And you can get upset and get impatient about it. Or you can bring a little joy to the situation. And when you do, you're bringing salt. You're bringing salt in a very simple way. Or you go to the bank and the teller's having a tough day. And you've been standing there in line and you saw that that previous customer really was giving them a hard time. There's something about being able to just say an encouraging word and smile and be a kind, gentle person. Bring Jesus into the everyday things of life. And you'll be amazed at how God will turn those things around for His glory. Sometimes I think we work at it so hard. And we try so hard. And it makes us strange. And what I'm saying is, just be yourself and let Jesus flow through you. And that pretty much takes care of itself. Because that's who you are. You are salt. You are light. Jesus intends for you to make a difference wherever you go. Where you are is more interesting because you're there. Because you're bringing salt. You're bringing light. You're bringing the life of Jesus into the situation. You're bringing the fruit of the Spirit into the situation. Jesus also said, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill can't be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. You are light. That's in the very nature and character of who you are as a Christian. Jesus has changed you from the inside out. He's already done that. And he's beginning to shine out through you. And people are going to see it. 
So don't try to hide it. Don't try to be a secret. You know, don't try to be secret about it. But just allow it to flow naturally. Allow the light of Jesus to shine through your life, through your attitudes, through your behaviors, through the little things that you say and the things that you do. Yeah, I get a little quote here from John Stott. In both of these metaphors of salt and light, Jesus teaches about the responsibility of Christians in a non-Christian or sub-Christian or post-Christian society. He emphasizes the difference between Christians and non-Christians, between the church and the world, and he emphasizes the influences one ought to have on the other, normally Christians on their non-Christian environment. The distinction between the two is clear. The world, he says, is like rotting meat, but you are to be the world's salt. The world is like a dark night, but you are to be the world's light. This is the fundamental difference between the Christian and the non-Christian, the church and the world. Salt and light. It just naturally flows from who you are, and unless you're trying to cover it up. Again, you don't have to be strange or weird. Just allow Jesus' light to flow through you. Allow the salt to preserve and to season and um, just make everyone's life better. There's one other part to this text I want us to see. He says, In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. How are they going to see salt? And how are they going to see light? By what you do. By what you do. Exactly. Now remember, you can't work your way into heaven by your good deeds, right? Not by works that we're saved. We're saved by grace through faith. It's not by works. But we are created to do good works when Jesus remakes us, when he changes us and transforms us and makes us his masterpiece. When that happens, we're created to do good works. So you get what he's trying to say here. The way you're going to show your salt and your light is by doing good deeds. Looking to the person who has a need and meeting the need. Serving them in love. It's especially as we reach out in mercy, as we reach out in love, as we express in practical ways that we care about them, that God opens the door for us to have words seasoned by salt, by grace. Salt, light, and deeds. Um, again, Glenn Stassen. Many people say we're to be salt and light. But this leaves out the climax. We are to be salt, light, and deeds. Jesus' teaching is threefold. The climax comes with the deeds. The deeds, that's how we show, in particular, the character of Jesus within us. So how do we do this then? This is salt and light for dummies. Okay, I don't know about you. There are some people who are Billy Grahams. And there are some of them who are really good evangelists on a personal level. But then there's the rest of us. Remember we had those dummies manuals for everything 20 years back, something like that. There was windows, dummies for windows, and dummies for all these things. Well, some of us need a dummies manual for sharing our faith. How do we be salt and light? And how do we live that out in daily ways? So that we aren't the strange person holding up the sign or doing something weird. How do we do it in a natural way? So that Jesus just flows through who we are. And it's in keeping with who he is making us. The first thing I would say is this. Step number one, learn to pray for lost people. The most important thing I think we can do, just as average, ordinary people, is we recognize that we can't do it by ourselves. We're not like, you know, hard, maybe a used car salesman is kind of the, what we always think of. You know, the person who's going to sell you something, and it doesn't matter if you want it or not, I'm going to sell you this thing. That never seems to work. And that ought to teach us something. Apart from me, you can do nothing, Jesus said. John 15. We have to pray. And when you feel helpless, and you want to do something, but you don't know what to do, what do you do? 
You pray about it. You pray for lost people. The most important thing I can tell you is that God loves it when we pray for lost people. It's on His heart too. I guarantee it. And we pray for them. And we pray again and again and again. And some of them we may pray our whole life and not see the answer to the prayer. But that doesn't mean it couldn't still happen. I love the example of George Mueller who had five friends and he prayed for them every day. These five friends from his youth. And he began to see, he saw two of them I think, went to the Lord after 20 or 25 years. He kept praying for them. And after he died, the remaining friends came to know Christ. He didn't ever see the answer to his prayer, but it was answered. I love that example. Because sometimes we get, you know, after a week or two, we think, is God hearing my prayer? No, be persistent. Keep at it. Keep praying. God is at work in the lives of people. Learn to pray. Learn to love people like Jesus. Be someone that they want to invite to the party and find the joy of the Lord. There is something about joyful people that bring other people and attract them to the Lord. We ought to be filled with joy. It's part of the fruit of the Spirit. When the Spirit of God is controlling us, we ought to be a joyful person, not condemning, hate-filled, you know, these things that sometimes people are in this world. I don't get it. Find the joy of the Lord. Learn to listen. So he says, I never know what to say. You know what? That's probably good. Learn to listen. <laughs> Ask good questions and listen to people. Pe the, most people want someone who's a good listener to come alongside them and just tell their story. Ask good questions and allow them just to tell what's going on in their lives. It often opens up the door to a deeper conversation. Learning to listen. Learn to invite people. When things happen, invite them. And sometimes, just like praying for them, you have to do it more than once because they don't always come right away. But keep inviting them. Look for the opportunities to put compassion into action. When you see a need, when you meet that need, you are Jesus in that situation more than you realize. When you see somebody who's really hurting, and you come along with an encouraging word, or you pray for someone who's really in need, or you meet a physical need, or a financial need, or whatever, God, you can use that to touch the lives of people. It worked in Jesus' ministry, and I know it works in ours as well. Look for the open doors. Look for God to open the door. Don't try to open the door yourself. And I remember when I was a kid, we had these flowers that grew outside of our house, and they get this big pot on the top. And I always thought, I want to open them up and get the flower out, you know? Have you ever tried to do that? When I was a kid, I always liked to, I thought, you know, I like it when the, the, the petals come out. I want to see the flower. I don't want to see this big green thing on the top. So I remember peeling it open before it was ready. You know what? It doesn't work. And it doesn't work that way in evangelism either. You can't open the door successfully. But when God opens the door, it's amazing how much easier everything works. Look for Him to open a door so that you can have the right words to say. And then, finally, look for fishing holes. Places where you know people are who need Jesus. Um, I like to go to coffee shops because people will talk to you in a coffee shop a little bit. And sometimes it leads to a conversation. There's other kind. Of, we have post office, which is a wonderful fishing hole. I'm not saying you should just hang out there all day, but you know, <laughs> you do have to go get the mail. There's people around. You talk to them. You know, you go to the market, or you, you get kind of creepy if you were there all the time. But, but nonetheless, you know what I'm saying. Look for where people are, and then talk to them. Show the love of Jesus. Let Jesus shine out of you, even in the simple things that you do. And it's amazing how doors begin to open. Plan and attend parties. Now, I'm not asking you to sin. Jesus didn't sin. Okay? And I'm not asking you to you know, go to some strange, crazy thing. But what I am saying is, 
take the opportunities that life brings us, like birthdays and anniversaries and whatever, these things in life, and invite your friends and invite your Christian friends and your neighbors and whoever. And just like Jesus had his Matthew party, so have parties with those kind of people where Christians are able to rub shoulders with those who need Jesus. It's a natural way for us to get to know each other and to share our faith with each other. We don't have to be standing over in the corner, you know, condemning them, you know, being holier than thou, but just love them. Just love them. It's the most important thing I can tell you. Be like Jesus and take him to the world. You see, being salt and light is mostly about living a life that's consistent with the Jesus who lives in you. And allowing him the freedom to work and to move. Salt, light, is evidence through our deeds. You know, I sometimes ask myself this question. It's an important one to ask. If your church was removed tomorrow from your neighborhood, from the community, would anybody notice? I know you would notice. But what about the people in our community? I ask the question because it's one of the most important questions we can ask ourselves. Are we being salt? Are we being light in this community? If we're not, what can we do to allow Jesus to make that light more present? And to get us out where the people are so that the salt can be spread around. That we can bring the seasoning of Jesus to this community who so desperately needs it. Lord, make us salt. Make us salty. Make us like Jesus. Make us like him. Let us be his light where things are dark. Let's pray.